All right, good morning. I know it's a bit early for uh, Vegas standards, so uh, <laughs> thanks for waking up and uh, joining us. Um, if you look at the, the title that we published, we called it New Solutions Leveraging uh, 5G Network. We couldn't say when we registered this uh, session, we couldn't say 5G plus wavelength. Uh, the reason was we were under embargo and it's only announced yesterday. What we want to do for the next uh, 60 minutes is uh, take you through this tech. Uh, what have we done on the, on the Verizon side? What have we done on the AWS side? And we also have a, a customer on board and they'll kind of, you know, he'll take you through the experience. So um, a quick way of introduction, Srini Kalapala. Um, I have the tech development at uh, Verizon. George uh, is the guy behind Wavelength. Um, but the biggest treat is we have the legendary game developer, Robert Duffy, if you, um, if you Google him, you'll find all the kind of cool games that uh, he's created, he's behind. In fact, he's going to push the envelope for us uh, to take the tech uh, where it needs to be. All right, so we want to talk about uh, what have we done. Um, and Andy said 18 months we've been working together. Um, is it simply putting uh, wavelength racks in, uh, in Verizon sites, or have we done anything uh, you know, deeper? So before we get there, um, I'll, uh, I'll take you through a little bit of Verizon 5G, um, how we are building the network, what are the things we are trying to, um, trying to uh, make, you know, bring to life. And then we'll go through a little bit more about our own journey in terms of uh, our technology, uh, the network virtualization, that what led to, uh, to this, this outcome that uh, we're looking at. So if you look at uh, 5G networks, uh, there are lots of 5G flavors you hear. Uh, but the one that we are building is the one that's actually going to bring all of these currencies to, uh, to life. Uh, if you had gone to our booth, 4, 426 and Hall D, Hall D or C, um, you will actually be able to experience a bandwidth you're talking about. Uh, we're, we're seeing 1.8 gigabits per second per device. Um, you can actually do the speed test and see. Now that's where we are today. Give us another 6, 12 months, you're going to see about you know, 3 to 4 gigs per Per device, and when the next generation of chipsets come in three years from now, we should be able to see uh, eight nine gigs per device. Now that's a that's a fundamentally different level of bandwidth, uh, you know, when compared to the 4G. Right, 4G today some devices can get up to 100 Mbps, but this is foundationally very different. Not only that, 5G network, at least the way we are building, it is uh, it's a dense network. We use a combination of millimeter wave and and other spectrums, and that means we have nodes, at, call it every half a mile, and because of the dense network, we're able to deliver within a given square um, kilometer area uh, 10 terabits of bandwidth. So that means you can have, take a stadium, take uh, you know, other, other areas where you have uh, you know, dense amount of population like uh, airports, we're able to deliver that you know, one GBPS for a, a number of users. A Couple of other things uh, to point out, uh, the number of devices, 5G is going to bring in uh, um, a lot more connected devices, just not uh, the, the smartphones we're used to, but many others. And the network will allow, because it's dense, it will allow uh, up to you know, um, the, the, the 1 million per uh, square kilometer. A couple of other things, because the way 5G network is built, we'll be able to deliver new services um, very dynamically. Matter of, when we say 90 minutes, we think it's, it could be even lower than that. And then latency is absolutely one of the things. So when you look at the network, the 5G itself, 5G NR brings in, uh, NR is a new radio, that's the, uh, that's the term, that brings in a lower latency. But when you pair that up with a, an edge compute, when you actually put the, the compute right next to the packet core within the network, then you're going to see latency sub uh, 10 milliseconds. So we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more. But this is the kind of network we're building. Now, to build a network like this, you'll need significant amount of uh, fiber. Uh, look, each node can carry multiple gigabits of uh, bandwidth, and they all have to be backhauled to somewhere else, and uh, that requires significant amount of uh, fiber. It also requires spectrum. We have uniquely the uh, almost uh, uh, one GB bandwidth uh, uh, width worth of uh, spectrum uh, compared to others. That allows us to deliver these you know, four, eight, uh, eight uh, GBPS per device. 5G is going to be a fully uh, virtualized uh, network, and that allows us to do some of the things we're going to show you uh, in a second. And then to 
to really enable the edge compute and the related applications, you need a lot of real estate and uh, in, a, in, a, in a key, dense, populated uh, urban areas. Um, and uh, Verizon happens to have a number of those locations, whether it is uh, our COs or whether it is our uh, in the aggregation points and others. These are the things that allow us to kind of you know, uh, deliver the, the sort of 5G uh, that uh, we are working towards. The other thing that you'll see uh, with uh, 5G coming in the next uh, uh, you know, few quarters would be slicing. So today's network, effectively, you have three kinds of uh, slices. You have a, uh, the, the broadband, the enhanced mobile broadband. You have uh, voice and messaging. With, uh, with 5G, a device can actually simultaneously latch onto eight different slices. Uh, the, the standards uh, talk about about 128 slices that you can actually uh, uh, deliver. Examples are uh, things like mass massive machine type communication, things like uh, ultra reliable low latency communication. These are some examples, but we think the way it's going to evolve is we will have slices that are meant for a type of application. They could be a, a gaming slice. They could be a, a V2X slice. They could be, uh, each one of them have a very different set of uh, uh, characteristics, and they have different needs. Uh, but with one common network, you're able to deliver all of these different uh, experiences. So how do we do before we go there? Um, where are we today? Uh, we were the first to launch 5G uh, here. We will have 5G in 30 cities. Uh, by the end of uh, this year, we're already there in 18. We have it in 14 NFL stadiums, and we're looking at uh, um, other sports venues, too. And we see this being the kind of network. Um, it's going to be very attractive in, in these uh, dense environments. So how do, we, how do we build this kind of network? Unlike the traditional networks, and uh, by the way, the folks who've been in the cloud journey, this looks uh, five years or 10 years ago. but. Uh, Networks, because of the way they're designed to deliver the reliability and others, we've been lagging behind in terms of, uh, um, call it technological advancement. So um, till a till couple of years ago, when we were to deploy a network application, it used to be in our plans. It comes with fully loaded the hardware, software, uh, pre-configured everything. We go put it into one of our sites, uh, hook it up, and it does what it's supposed to do. And we had appliances like that spread across, across uh, our entire footprint. A few years ago, we started working on virtualizing all of these applications. So generic infrastructure, uh, OpenStack, uh, uh, you know, kind of running virtualization layer, and then uh, you have uh, uh, the network applications. Now, 5G is going to be a cloud-native um, core and cloud-native uh, uh, baseband application. So we're going to have the way we are deploying 5G is going to be a fully cloud-native, stretched all the way to the edge. What does that mean? What it means is, if you look at our footprint, we have radios, uh, macro towers, and others. Uh, they are talking to what we call uh, CRAN sites, centralized radio access network sites. Then they get aggregated through an aggregation point. This is where we have packet core, the, the packet gateways, and others. And then from there, they go to data centers, whether it is Amazon, whether it is uh, somebody else's data center, uh, to actually host the application that the end user is looking at. Now, as we are virtualizing, all of these points look, start looking like uh, our own network uh, cloud site. So uh, we have our own network cloud uh, you know, uh, deployment internally. We use that infrastructure and a combination of OpenStack and others to host our applications. But when you start looking at us a uh, couple of years from now, this is how I'm guessing all the telecoms will look like, but this is how we're going to look like. Uh, we're probably a little bit ahead uh, than others. Now, what, what the, the, the intent of the slide is that if you look at the latencies at each of these points, if you were to bring, let's say, a cloud like Amazon and put it uh, close to a cell site, we can deliver um, uh, three milliseconds to five milliseconds latencies. So if you have an application which is uh, um, highly latency sensitive, um, you want to kind of deliver that sort of exp experience, you put wavelength right there, and you can deliver that experience. So you go to CRAN site, about 10 milliseconds. Go to aggregation site, 30, 40 milliseconds. So um, th these are the kind of latencies uh, that uh, the mobile users, and, and by the way, this can also be delivered to 
uh, in-home broadband users and others, but these are the kind of latencies that they can, um, they can start uh, experiencing. So, so what does this mean? Uh, how are we kind of leveraging this to deliver, um, call it emerging uh, experiences? So, so let me take you to how we're doing that. The way we're doing that is, if you look at our network today, you use your smartphone and let's say you're trying to browse a site or go to an application, this is the path it's going to take, the, the red dotted line. It's going to go through the different cell site, the baseband's and others. It's going to go through a packet gateway, and then it'll get to some sort of a peering point, uh, and then eventually gets to whatever cloud is hosting that particular application. This is typical internet latency. Anywhere between 70 to 100 milliseconds is what you experience. Now, what if we were to put a, uh, an edge compute, a cloud right there in our aggregation sites, then we can start delivering 30 milliseconds or, or, or lower experiences. Now, let, let's take that a uh, bit further. So we are working on, so today the way it happens is net, the traffic between a, a, a smartphone or a device to packet gateway goes through a tunnel. It's called GTP. Um, and uh, the first point where it anchors to an IP is going to be at a packet gateway. So it is very difficult to recognize what is the traffic before that point. What if you start isolating the different kinds of traffic, maybe based on a slice, maybe based on the kind of application, and start delivering that traffic to the, uh, the compute uh, right close to where the user is, then you can, you can get to these 10 milliseconds we're talking about. So the way we are, we are looking at is that uh, through the control plane, user plane separation, we're deploying these uh, uh, integrated gateways. That, that, and, and we have some technology internally that can detect the kind of traffic that requires uh, the processing close, and then you can, you can start uh, delivering that latency. Now, what if we move that edge compute even closer to the end user? The same elements that we're deploying will allow us to detect the traffic, depending on the latency and, and whatever requirements are there, we'll be able to route the traffic to that the closest uh, uh, cloud server and uh, deliver the experience. The so what of it is this. The so what of it is, uh, there's a bit of animation here if I can, uh, let's see, yeah. This, this is the world we live in today, and especially if you're dealing with VR, AR, and some uh, content-rich and latency-sensitive applications, typically the way they're working is that you either download the entire content ahead of time, and then you play through these clunky headsets, and, uh, uh, and, and the experience is not so good. You can't have a very thin device, or you can't have a device that is uh, uh, you know, low battery consumption. Um, and then uh, you actually end up carrying all the processing power with you because the processing is actually happening uh, at the, the end user side. So what if we move, this is, this is the, the point of what we talked, what was announced yesterday. What if we move um, AWS closer to the, to the network edge? What you end up getting is um, very low latencies. You can actually offload some of the computing uh, power, whether it's GPU capabilities and others, from the end device into the cloud. That means now you have a low power consuming devices, uh, even potentially low cost devices, um, but still delivering the kind of experiences that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the developers and others are looking for. So the essence of what uh, was announced yesterday um, is this, that we are bringing wavelength uh, servers into Verizon's uh, uh, edge network sites, and we're, the, the way I've kind of you know, taken through in the previous slides, that's how we're integrating them between us and, uh, and uh, Wavelength. Now I'll let, uh, George will actually take you through uh, the full good details of Wavelength and how um, it allows you as a developer to leverage the entire um, AWS ecosystem to develop applications that can get this sort of benefits. Yeah, thanks Rini. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is George Eliseos. I'm uh, the general manager of uh, AWS Wavelength. Super excited to be here today with Rini. We've, uh, we've been through a long journey working through this, uh, finally being able to announce this to you and actually get it to the hands of some of our customers is super exciting for us. Um, <clears throat> so when we, uh, when we look at um, Srini's uh, slide about 
how, how the latency plays across um, uh, mobile edge and, uh, and, and internet and the AWS region. Um, we we, we want to look at what we are really delivering at cast, to customers. Um, when we're thinking about the value proposition of what we're doing, what is it really that customers really want and that we're giving to, in the, to their hands with AWS Wavelength? Uh, latency is the obvious one. We talked a little bit about latency. Uh, and the latency uh, of today's situation when you have a mobile device trying to reach uh, um, an application server up on the cloud is that you have to go through these multiple network hops, right? You have to go to the antenna, and then you have to go to the, uh, through the mobile network in various aggregation points, reach a, a transit or peering point of the mobile network that uh, then routes you through the internet up to the AWS region. Um, so that route actually implies that there, there are a lot of hops, but there is also a lot of unpredictability. Um, you have, um, because the routing goes over the internet, you have internet weather, you have various uh, peering points, you have um, the location of the end user and where they are determining your latency. And that, um, that gets us to these 100 milliseconds or more of latency from today's mobile devices. And yes, you can do some optimization, and 5G does bring some of that optimization on, for example, reducing some of the networking latency from the uh, user equipment to, uh, to the mobile core, uh, but those are incremental improvements. What we are trying to do here is to find out what if we uh, do some drastic improvement on the latency and, uh, and kind of like try to revolutionize the, the latency game by bringing the cloud very close to the, to the uh, end user and get down to 10 milliseconds, get down to single digit millisecond latencies. What, what, does, what happens if we can introduce this step function uh, improvement on, on latency, and uh, rather than thinking about marginal improvements, um, and what we see from customers as we're talking through them, these are these are these are obviously very new capabilities. Uh, is that the game changes? Uh, the, 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 the experience that you can deliver now, and the applications that you can build when you're reaching those limits of human perception, or when you're reaching applications that can be truly reactive to their environment, is a game changer. But it's not just about latency. When we're talking to customers, we find out that latency and averages are great. But when latency becomes mission critical, um, what also matters is the variability of that latency. Um, you can easily, not easily, but you can deliver a few milliseconds of latency. But also what matters is, can I deliver that consistently? So can I deliver it instead of the 50 percentile, can I deliver it at the 90th and the 99 percentile? And the approach that we're taking here with bringing the cloud very, very close to the end user is cutting out a lot of these um, unpredictable routing decisions that the internet can make, um, these inefficient and changing uh, conditions, and uh, reducing the, the latency jitter and minimizing it, allowing um, customers to, to our, our customers to deliver consistent experience to their end users. So think about, for example, an, uh, an editor that is doing color grading on a, on a, on a big f uh, film um, on, on the cloud, uh, on the cloud w w uh, desktop. What happens is actually our brain learns how to adjust to latency. So as you're going through those frames trying to color grade a film, your brain can start predicting what the latency is going to be, and you can actually deliver a pretty good experience. However, if that latency changes as you're interacting with your application, as you're interacting with your, with your film, then your brain gets confused about what to expect. And reducing that latency actually increases the, uh, uh, improves the, the user experience dramatically. So we talked a little bit about latency. We talked a little bit about jitter or about the variability of that latency. But there is more value here that um, uh, Wavelength um, and 5G can deliver to customers. Um, as Srini uh, uh, took us through, 5G is a step up in bandwidth, in connectivity, in number of devices that you can connect. Uh, and it's fascinating to see all of that innovation that's happening in the network today that um, makes 5G a different G than the other Gs, as, as you guys <laughs> uh, uh, often explain. Um, but what happens then when you have now 
let's say, you're, when you're trying to build a solution that um, has 20 high-definition uh, high cameras, 10K video, that does intruder detection. Now you have 5G can carry all, the, all, all that data, but how do you really um, uh, process that data? Do you ship everything back up to the cloud and try to do uh, face detection there or intruder detection there? That's a way to do it. However, uh, that's inefficient because you're shipping a lot of data up that you might not need. You might need only a few frames of that or part of the picture of that, but also requires long-term long connections from your end devices, whether they be cameras or other sensors, which makes them uh, less efficient. It, it <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> it makes them less efficient. It makes them um, require large batteries, etc. What if you could reduce that time and do some of the processing at the edge? so that you don't have to ship 20 uh, high definition streams up to the up to the cloud but do that you know very close to where data is really generated and you can take that example and kind of like think of more and more use cases of how that plays and when we are when we are looking at the use cases this is very much in our dna in looking at who is the customer what are the use cases what do they really really need um, we see a, a lot of use cases that are true today we see game streaming and uh, we have Robert Duffy, very uh, uh, um, uh, proud to be on the same stage <laughs> as you today. Um, he will talk through uh, uh, some of the work, that the great work that they're doing with Project Orion uh, later, but you have virtual reality, you have real-time rendering. Uh, you have a lot of these use cases that are very obvious. You can see them today. Uh, they, they, they are emerging, they're still a little bit nascent, but you can predict them. Um, however, you see other use cases that are a little bit more out there, like you know, when you're talking about industrial automation, about smart cities, IoT, Srini mentioned uh, vehicle and you know, autom uh, autonomous vehicles or vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and things like that, that are a little bit more further out. These are all super interesting use cases that we can predict today. However, if I were to tell you um, 10 years ago that your phone will have 10x the processing power that it has, what would you imagine your phone would do? Maybe video calling, right? That's the incremental imagination that we have, right? Like the things that we can predict and we can think of today are based on what we know today. These are with delivering our customers this very low predictable latency uh, compute at the edge we're giving them an, an opportunity and uh, a capability that they didn't have before. So what we really think is that 99% of the applications we can't imagine today. So we think that our customers are gonna be using these capabilities to innovate uh, beyond the use cases, the immediate use cases that we hear today. Whether that is a thin client, whether that is a vacuum cleaner that uh, uh, looks at pathogens on your uh, carpet and kills them automatically, but doesn't cost $20,000 because it can use a $20,000 server that does GPU processing at the edge uh, to uh, broadcasting and to uh, 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 autonomous drones and cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when we're looking at how do we deliver those uh, capabilities to, to our customers in order to innovate, where do we start? Um, where, the way that we approached it is we want to start with giving them some very, very strong primitives that they, they already know how to use and they already can, um, can predict how, how to use and not have that extra degree of learning in order to use this. So our customers are used at, today at regions, they're used to availability zones, uh, and they're, they're used at making these deploy, the, the deployments in a certain way and using certain tools. And that's what we're trying to mirror here. So when we're building Wavelength, we're delivering AWS as is to the edge with minor changes. The, the way that we're doing that is through the Wavelength zone. A Wavelength zone is, you can think about it as the equivalent of an availability zone today. Uh, it is the same AWS that you have today in your region but it is um, uh, uh, in, in your data center, but it is designed to be delivered at the edge of the 5G network. It is basically a zone hosted uh, in a site within the 5G network, and Srini told us a little bit about the, um, 
the architecture of that network, and depending on, on the latency that we want to get, we can place it in different places within the 5G network. Uh, it's managed from a region, so you can think of the wavelength zone as a, an additional, uh, as an extension of that, of that region. You can see it as, an, uh, as a zone that you can extend your VPC to and um, uh, assign a subnet to, and then you can build on top of that. So we're using the VPC as the abstraction layer. <coughs> Uh, and it's fully integrated into the 5G network, which means that you don't have to do any, any work yourself on understanding how do I connect to the user equipment. Uh, you'll get an IP that's an IP within the uh, Verizon 5G network, and you can talk directly to the, to, the, to the end device. There's no integration for you to do there. So what is kind of unique of this approach uh, is what we've seen again and again our customers really enjoy, which is that you can build once, deploy anywhere. Uh, it's a single pane of glass. You go to your management console, you go to your AWS API, and you can see the wavelength zones like you see you know, your US uh, East to a AZ. Um, you can uh, uh, easily uh, include ads within your applications today, so you can easily extend your applications to have those low, low latency parts deployed at the, uh, at the, at the edge. Um, and the key here is that because this is an extension of AWS and it's not like something special that we're doing, it's the same AWS that you get in the region, anything, all of the innovation that we put into our services, into our regions, automatically translates to the, to, the, to the wavelength zone. So when there is a new feature of EC2, you directly get it. When there is a new tagging feature, when there is a new uh, identity and access management feature, you just directly get it when there is a new VPC feature. And, and of course, because it is connected to the region, you can do failover between region and edge, and, and you can split your application to optimize that. We already have one wavelength zone going in Chicago. Uh, connected to the 5G network live, and we have some demos, and um, you guys should check out the Verizon booth afterwards because it's, uh, there are some really cool demos going on there. Um, but you can think of, um, of, uh, the, uh, of the wavelength zones as we go into the next year and beyond, uh, having uh, dozens of those across the US, uh, being able to serve your users everywhere they are, um, whether they are in a, a, a big metropolitan urban center or whether um, it's a, a, an industrial center across the U.S. So we're spreading out as 5G also uh, evolves and uh, deploys. So when we're thinking about the architecture, and I won't go in, into a lot of detail here because there is another session right after, I think it's at... Uh, 11.30, we have the, the, the code at the end. You, you guys should check it out if you, if you want to go into more detail about how do you use um, Wavelength. Um, the, the key thing here is that the control management and monitoring happens through the region, and the Wavelength zone is an extension of that region. So probably what you will end up doing is you will have your back end of your applications in a region, your scalable um, back end that is not low uh, latency sensitive, and you'll deploy the latency sensitive uh, part of the application in, in, in the wavelength zone. For example, your game streaming server might be in the zone, but your uh, player data or your database or um, uh, state of your, of your game might be elsewhere. Um, so the, the whole idea is that you combine these things uh, in order to build applications that are both efficient, but also tackle these uh, brand new use cases, and we're really, really Looking forward to see uh, what you guys do with that. So before passing on um, uh, the mic, uh, I'll just do a quick recap of uh, what are the value propositions here that we're bringing to you. Uh, first of all, Wavelength is public. Anyone will be able to access it. You don't, want, you don't need a special deal with us or with Verizon. You go to your AWS management console and you just use it. Um, no commitments, it's not, you don't have to buy a three year or a five year or a 10 year hardware or, uh, uh, or, uh, or um, a commit to anything if you don't wish to. Uh, there is no need to own hardware, there's no need to own data centers, there's no need to go and do special networking. Any developer can use this to deploy low latency applications 
to, that serve 5G uh, devices. Uh, the other key thing is you have the AWS ecosystem, because this is completely open to everyone. You have the AWS ecosystem uh, accessing it, whether they are ISVs, whether they are, they are uh, solution providers, system integrators. We, we will see this ecosystem evolve. Um, and you will use the same tools, the same services, and the same primitives that you use in AWS in order uh, today in, the, in your AZs in the wavelength zones. Um, you can therefore seamlessly uh, leverage that breadth that the, of the AWS platform that is so attractive to developers and work across region and edge to build these cool new applications. Robert, to you. Hello, I'm Robert um, Duffy. I'm the CTO at Ed Software. Um, we've been, uh, you know, at Ed, we've got a, uh, what, what, what I consider a very rich history of gaming innovations and entertainment innovations um, from uh, the very first first person shooter, first multiplayer, first esports, commercially vi first commercially viable VR. Um, at Bethesda, we've you know, um, the first DLC with horse armor, if anybody bought that, I did. Um, and, you know, we've pioneered open world gaming and we've continued to kind of push um, entertainment technology kind of as far as we can take it. And I think, you know, since the, you know, since the early 90s uh, with the original Wolfenstein 3D and moving on through Dooms and Quakes and everything that we've done, uh, kind of technology innovation is, is, is kind of in our blood. Um, Project Orion is, a, is, is an, an initiative that we announced um, at E3 this year, um, and it's game streaming technology. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, we, we all know game streaming is coming. You know, if you remember the early days of Netflix and the early days of, of music streaming, there were rough patches, and but we know it's coming. And um, what we, well, where we, why we started Orion was basically, we have you know, you know, cumulatively hundreds of years of experience with game engines, and fighting latency, and what do, what do players expect? What do our customers want? Um, and so we 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 tackle the problem differently than than everybody else is. Um, the way most gaming streaming services work is it's just brute force. You, you apply hardware and you compress it real time and that's what you do. So um, we came up with a, with, a, with a number of techniques that are integrated at the game engine that, um, that leverages things the game engine does and helps the streaming process. Um, and uh, now that we're working with um, Verizon 5G and the AWS Wavelink, um, you know, that was a big thing for us. Um, and again, from, from an Orion perspective, we built this from the ground up. We started completely clean. We have a very, again, long history with IDTech and engines, but we started completely clean. Um, and, you know, streaming a high quality console experience is, you know, uh, there's a lot of technical challenges because if you're streaming a movie, you have the luxury of spending as much time as you want to compress that movie um, at whatever quality you want, and then that single source can serve millions of customers. Uh, game streaming, we're having to do it um, at 60, 60 frames per second, 60 hertz, uh, real time, so we're encoding real time, we're having to deliver it, we're decoding real time, we're having the input latency back to the server, and so on and so on, so there's a lot of things. Latency is the key. Um, and the last mile problem, which you know, you may have heard of is kind of the, you know, it's kind of from your, from your service provider to your house. And what we found in practice is it's more like the last 50 feet. Because um, a lot of people have really great connectivity to their house, but, you know, you're at Walmart and you're like $39 router, that looks pretty good. Um, but it's, so it's that last 50 feet that is really what kills us. And it's the number of hops. And, you know, Keeping the hops down is, is really key. And while we think that Orion provides the best streaming service available, the opportunity to work with Verizon 5G and the AWS Wavelength, we were super excited. And, and I don't know if we were the first customer, 
We were certainly we're one, one of the first. Because yeah. yeah. um, I think we were we were deploying our things as they were actually, you know, screwing the the, the blade the rack, to the yeah. racks. Um, and it's and it, the onboarding was really really good, and you know it's really really been overall really good the whole partnership. Um, we've been running on we've run we've been running Orion on AWS for quite some time, and as um, George just described, the transition for us was really straightforward. Um, you know, all of our management software runs on AWS, and um, I think the transition literally took us a day and a half to really kind of, we have something running, you know, there were, again, there's bumps in the road. It's all brand new technology. Orion's new, Wavelink's new, 5G Edge is new, but uh, onboarding as a customer on their pilot program, I can say has been as seamless as you would ever expect something to be, uh, you know, from a customer perspective. Um, and uh, it's been really, really good. So looking forward, this is this is where I get really excited. Um, you know, the partnership that we're we're starting with with AWS and Verizon, Bethesda, uh, Orion Tech, um, we're going to provide the best streaming experience that you can imagine. Um, again, we want to. We we don't want to. We're going to deliver you know console plus experiences to gamers everywhere. We want people to be able to play when they want, where they want, on a device they want, et cetera. And that's great, that's, that's the status quo. Where we're looking is in a future where what can we do at the edge with all this compute that nobody else can do? And that's where, again, that's where we get really excited as game developers is we feel we can develop experiences that you've never seen. What if we're not using a single blade? What if we're using an entire rack? Well, okay, that's great. Let's use an entire cluster. What kind of what kind of entertainment experiences can we build that you've never seen? And that's what's going to push game streaming into the forefront because you're going to be able to play things that you just can't play on a high-end PC or a console. And that's that's where we're starting to focus our attention. Um, and you know. We're really excited about the future of all this. So, you know, that's about all I've got. I need water. <laughs> water. Um, but that's what we're going to see, and, and, and this combination uh, of the, uh, again, with with AWS and Verizon, has been amazing. And again, we're going to, you know, we're going to change the future. So, this is the start. We we can't not uh, go forward without uh, the next slide, your creation. Yeah. So, oh yeah, Doom. Let's yeah. talk about this. This is the I first game that. that's on the on the edge. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, really interesting as we as we're talking to you and the rest of the people at Bethesda is, as you guys are getting more creative with with these capabilities, you start thinking about what could I do if I can scale this? What can I do but, if I can? Yeah, and that, that's exactly what we're, we're excited because, you know, I want to build, you know, as a game developer, I've been doing this a long time, I want to build things that nobody has ever experienced. And, you know, you're always limited by the lowest common denominator. Um, you have to run on this console and, and, and or, or this, and and we're starting to see those limits getting raised and you know, Doom is a hard problem. It's a 60 hertz game. It's a twitch shooter, um, and you know, it's, it's it's where we started because we're like, if you can, if you can stream Doom, you can stream anything. Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of like Doom Classic runs on everything from ATMs to old printers to old cameras. Uh, they, you know, people have ported Classic Doom to everything. And we used kind of Doom 2016 as our basis for if we can, you know, early on we had some really big successes. Uh, one, of the, one of the lead designers on Doom, we set him down, didn't tell him what he was playing on, and just said, what do you think? And he said, it seems like the, uh, you know, the, 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 the theater mode is on on the TV. So the TV's adding some milliseconds of latency. And for us, that was a huge win because if that's the only thing you notice, considering you're streaming this from 300 miles away, then you know that's a big win. And um, 
Um, but you know, Doom runs great. You can check it out at the Verizon booth. Um, it's running on 5G phones. Looks great. Awesome game. If you don't have it, you should get it. <laughs> At plus one, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are, we're really excited um, that um, customers like Pedesta can, can take this and, and, and start thinking about what the future is. You, uh, as, as Robert said, streaming has been around as an idea for a while, but now we're kind of changing the game when we're telling you, hey, you can scale this as much as you want, and then you can scale back down. Um, and you can use the um, most powerful servers out there uh, placed within kilometers of your, uh, uh, of your edge user. So uh, we're really excited that um, this is finally in our customers' hands and really looking forward over the next few months to scaling this out. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, George and Robert. So uh, in summary, we are bringing the 5G network uh, and all of its capabilities. Uh, with the wavelengths together as, as an offering. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Robert talked about some of the stuff they have done in a, in a literally matter of a, a couple of days to get it onboarded. We have a few other experiences that we are already you know, showing, uh, AR, VR, computer vision, and others. Um, the, the goal of this partnership is that developers see this as yet another way they can innovate um, without having to learn new set of tools, without having to really go redesign everything that you do. And that's, that's, what, that's what I want to uh, put in front of us. So um, this slide is effectively uh, the capabilities it will bring together. Josh talked about the 99 person that we don't know that you guys are going to innovate. This is the one person. To, uh, this is all we can imagine, but I think there's a lot more um, that that's how that, uh, you are going to innovate. And, and we're looking forward to that. Um, quick links if you want to know more about it. And here are a couple of. Uh, you can go to our booth and experience the 5G connectivity and experiences. Um, you can go to any of these uh, sites, and, uh, and there's more information on how. Uh, if you want to try it on, for example, in the, uh, at the Chicago site, you, know, you, can, you can sign up, and there's a, there's a whitelisting process that we can take you through and get you on board um, to, to experience some of this. So any questions? I think we've got a few minutes. Please. So it's a, a two-part. The question was, uh, um, are we uh, hosting an outpost server and uh, within our network, or are we hosting Amazon software on our own hardware? Right? Um, it's not outpost, number one. It's actually wavelength. The key difference is multi-tenancy and all the other things that come with. It's public, meaning anybody can access. In case of outpost, it's, uh, it's meant for enterprise and others where single tenant. So that's the key difference. It is AWS wavelength hardware that is placed in Verizon um, sites. Uh, and we have done integration uh, at a network API level integration between wavelength and the Verizon network to kind of deliver the, those experiences. Yeah, if I can add to that, uh, the, it is the AWS hardware that you find in the region. It's the same kind of driving technology that you would have in Outpost to extend the region into your data center. But in this, in this case, we're extending the region into uh, the 5G network. So it is this, uh, and it's super important for us to kind of get that across that it is the same hardware, the same APIs, of the same the same experience. So it, if you have something running in a region today, in a you know in a GPU instance, and you want to port that to a wavelength zone in a GPU instance, it's going to be the same. Right, Outpost is, um, is, a, is a way that AWS can extend um, the, the AWS cloud into a rack or a, a set of racks in order to put it in your data center, but Outpost as a product require, uh, will, will have you buying a rack and uh, putting it in your data center and having a data center. So the technology is very similar here and based on, on Outpost, but the key thing is, is this is public and on demand, so you don't have to you can just clean up like you would do in a region you would spin up a, an instance, you would do the same here. Please. Uh, 
So, uh, I'll, I'll take Go ahead, please, please, please. So the, the question was, are we talking just about EC2 or are we talking about more services? So the core thing that we are delivering to start with is EC2 container services, some storage services. However, we are being very careful on which services are the low latency services that our customers really require to deliver to the edge rather than delivering um, everything locally. We want to be very um, uh, prescriptive about what you, what you need in order to, to run your application. So it will be not just EC2, it's a number of services, but it's not the full, for example, S3 is not delivered to, to start with in wavelength zones. Um, you would be obviously uh, looking back into your region to connect uh, to, to various of these services. So, um, question. Uh, uh, the, sorry, yeah, let me repeat the story. Uh, the question is uh, for everybody's benefit uh, how do we look at network capacity um, in terms of slicing and how it's allocated between the slices? Um, that's something that uh, we are. So, number one, slicing is not available as a, as a capability at all. Uh, there is a standards wise, there's a, there's a technology called Option 2. Option 2 standalone core. Uh, will start emerging into the marketplace at a chipset and uh, software level probably sometime mid to late next year. And it'll start manifesting in devices in, probably in 2021, uh, if you look at uh, high-level timelines. Um, once this entire building block set is uh, deployed, devices, software, the network, and everybody has this, then we will have the capabilities to start deploying slices all the way from device. Device will have ability to choose a slice. Network exposes something called NSSF, Network Slice Selection Function. Um, you could basically decide which slices uh, can be available to which user. Uh, the point of how much capacity, look, it's going to start, in, in our view, broadband taking the bigger chunk. But URLLC, MMTC, and, and some of the other uh, technologies start maturing, V2X and others, we anticipate capacities will start then getting distributed uh, across these. Uh, the bigger thing for all of us, and this is where a little bit of AI and others are going to play a role, is how do you optimize across slices? The last thing you want to do is um, make it inefficient because you reserve some slices and capacity, but that's not utilized, whereas there is demand elsewhere, right? So how quickly do we move? And that's why the underlying uh, uh, cloud-native architecture is very important so that we can you know, quickly move between the slices in a very dynamic manner and also scale up and down depending on you know, where the, the usage is. So, a uh, bit of learning to go through in the next uh, few quarters. Please. Um, assuming this would work across your full range of spectrum that you have, just all sorts, when you kind of migrate to that full cloud platform that you were discussing in, I mean, ultimately, do you tie the wireline network into this? Um, you know, right at the edge there? Also? Good, good question. So, uh, the question is uh, uh, does this tie to all kinds of spectrum that we have? And uh, the 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 slide I showed, which talks about the virtualization path we are on, by when it will be done, um, and will it expand beyond what mobile networks and to, to the wireline networks? So, uh, to, to the first question, um, the, the way we are deploying is that, uh, look, 5G is not in every location today, right? I mean, as you saw, we said 18 cities, 30 cities by the end of the year, and then it will expand, will be nationwide uh, you know, fairly soon. The, but when a phone is not 5G coverage, it's going to fall back into 4G. This network is connected to both 4G. Um, this particular cloud is connected to both 4G and 5G, which means uh, through the packet core, whether it's 4G or 5G packet core, we route the packets to the, uh, to the wavelength and then get served. So uh, let's say applications not requiring that high bandwidth can still be served, and you'll still see the kind of you know, uh, latency and other benefits uh, that come with it. Um, our journey towards virtualization, we are we are fully virtualized in a packet core, but the way carriers tell you is we got the entire packet core and, and everything virtualized, but not all capacity is already there. And the, the reason for that is we have appliances that we've acquired two, three, four years before, and as they get to end of life, the migration path is now you go towards virtualization. So most of the, our entire network functions are virtualized. We are carrying end-to-end -end traffic through the virtual uh, infrastructure. 5G will be fully virtualized. There's no physical uh, uh, gear out there. What we deployed, even uh, what we deployed today, is virtualized. The RAN is going to become fully virtualized. So the baseband, which is where the most of the complexity is, uh, that that is now fully cloud native, and we'll start deploying with with the NR starting next year. Uh, the, by the way, we use the term uh, 
uh, mobile access, uh, or sorry, mobile edge compute, but it's actually multi-access edge compute to simplify uh, for, for everybody, we kind of started using mobile. It is multi-access. In fact, uh, we, can, we, we will eventually think of having uh, the Wavelength servers not only on the wireline, but wireless network, I'm sorry, the other way, wireless, uh, as well as wireline networks, which means that we have our Fios network in, uh, in uh, you know, nine different states that where we offer a home broadband. We could deliver these low latency and the high you know, uh, intense uh, experiences through those. Uh, uh, the network integration uh, wise, it's pretty similar, just different protocols and different servers we have to deal with. Uh, but we are starting with mobile. This is where the excitement is, but we, ex we plan to expand further. The mobile integration is something that I'm also really excited about. Um, both your questions about how do we expose some of those, those network functionalities yeah. to developers is, and, and that's why we think 5G is the, the thing that we should prioritize and work first on because of all the promise of additional capabilities that we can deliver to, to, to our customers. But I mean, also, this becomes a direct connection to the right in AWS location, right? So why wouldn't you leverage that to do that if you wanted to? It's like if I'm an enterprise and you have closer to the right connectors to advance. Oh, you mean uh, instead of wire, instead of wireline? Using wire, I mean, yeah. you know, if you have an on-ramp really, really close by, is that good? What? Yeah. yeah, so, well, the, the whole wire conversation is, a, I think, a completely different conversation because there are so many different solutions there. But here, here is what's happening with 5G. 5G has a promise of um, replacing a lot of the connectivity solutions out there, from wired to Wi-Fi to other, other solutions. And if we look at that future where 5G is the, let's say, single connectivity or one of the few connectivity solutions out there, we think it's super important and it, it's the, the thing to prioritize to be in. Uh, because we see the promise there, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, we did. We actually did live testing in Chicago um, a few weeks ago, and uh, we sent a couple of our, of our QA kids out there to, to basically you know test to make sure everything's working. And their experience was 5G was was better than wireless, um, and you know that's what we're looking for because as soon as you can, as soon as I can get that at my house, and it's ubiquitous, awesome. right? You don't have to switch over your, right. you know, you're you're moving from place to place. You're switching no. over from Wi-Fi to to LTE, etc. So it's the ubiquity. It's the promise of eight, nine gigs uh, down, you know, speeds to your to your handset, uh, where there it can become like a single, like a very thin client, if you if you can run off. So. It's, it's an interesting question to see how the wired landscape evolves, given that, because everything kind of evolves. It's not only 5G, other things evolve as well. So, uh, but we do think that 5G has a promise there, uh, also for this integration between cloud and networking. If, if you look at Verizon beyond those eight, nine states where you have Fios, we also have, uh, not only we're offering 5G as a mobile offering, but there's a fixed wireless offering. We already offer in five cities, and you'll see that ramping up next year. And in that world, you know, there's no difference. I mean, you could be at home, you could be outside, seamless. So you're on the same network and you experience uh, the, the similar experiences. Yeah. Please. I see, yeah. Yeah, the question, uh, let me repeat your question in summary is, if I don't get all of the AWS services at the 5G edge, then does it defeat the purpose that I have to go back and talk to the region, et cetera? So when we're looking through how applications are architected, this is not how we expect people will build here. Um, for example, you may not need your database to be at the edge. Um, obviously, the edge is a more constrained environment and doesn't have the scale of an AWS region. So do you really need five millisecond latency to your database? And even if you do, does your database really give you five milliseconds, right? Like, you know, you'd, you'd have to use the, the right types of databases and the right, the, so you, it's not like we can't bring RDS to the edge. It's will people really need RDS at the edge? Will our developers need RDS to the edge? So what we're doing here is we're, we're building the, the platform and then we can build on top of that. We can bring more AWS services to the edge as needed, but we don't think that this is a priority for customers right now. So there, are, there is a big part of... Yeah. 
Of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you if you architect your application to have um, communication to your backend database in the path of low latency, then you might need to make some changes there. But the way that we see people building here and customers building here is, for example, if you have a if you have a game streaming service, you won't put everything at the edge. You put the game streaming server at the edge, but you may you may put your game state or other things like that in your database in the region where it's more scalable, uh, more efficient, uh, and you know, obviously uh, the, the edge is a more constrained environment that you can't necessarily build everything up, uh, at that point. I mean, I'd, I would add to his example, uh, if you notice yesterday's announcement, inference was one of the things that Andy announced as a new item. We expect that eventually could be on the edge along with EC2, because you're running compute, you probably also want to do some inference, uh, uh, AI and ML inferencing at the edge with the computer vision and others. So that's a, a natural extension of what, uh, what we do compared to RDS, for example. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. You wouldn't train your models at the edge, yeah. but you'd, you'd do the inference at the edge, the inference part. So you will move parts of your application. And, and that's why we, we think it's so important that you're connected to the region and you have that seamless connection between the two, which we provide. You don't have to. All right, we have time for one last question. Well, game streaming? <laughs> AR, VR are another set of applications. Computer vision. In fact, in uh, some of the examples that we get from our customers who are actually talking to us quite a bit is um, they would like to, they see computer vision cameras as the, the most ubiquitous sensor. It can sense any kind of thing. And they want to do the inferencing at the edge. So, and tie that to their either manufacturing processing, their, you know, we have an example uh, uh, we announced, I think, Corning is one of them where we, have a campus network deployed, 5G campus network, um, with computer vision cameras and others, and uh, we're using that to do some sort of inventory management and tracking and others, of their manufacturing process. So um, those are the kind of applications we start seeing. I, I think this is where we, we I think uh, we're not the, the smartest ones to tell what all applications could come. We're looking for developers to come back and say, look, we gave you all these ingredients, what can you do with it? That's an option where you could actually have a campus network with a um, kind of an outpost co-located. And uh, yeah, that, that could be an example. Yeah. So the, the way that we're um, planning the, 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 the scaling of this over the next year is we are picking large population centers, like large urban environments, metro centers, industrial centers. But however, we are already in discussions between us and yeah. with customers on what happens if I have my campus, which is not in a major metro center, and I want to extend wavelength and the 5G into there, and, and that's um, definitely something that we're, uh, we're looking at on, on yeah. how doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. everyone.